pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, under God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And Kate is not here this evening. Christina, if you would do the roll call, please. Excused, yeah. Here. Lisa Collins? I have not heard from her, so. Gary Dunlow? Here. 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 Cheryl Here. Here. Okay, with five of the seven school board members present, I would declare a quorum. Notice um, of the, uh, I'm sorry, board norms and reflections. If you would take a minute to look over the board norms and reflect on um, what we've established. I think as we begin a new year, we've reelected current board members, so we may want to take a look at. Um, those norms again on an annual basis, but we may not see as much change because we have the same folks coming back. But um, they are in our, bo our board folder and in the Dropbox. Approval of the agenda. I would note that the agenda has been posted, distributed, and um, sent to the local media. With this in mind, are there any changes? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda as posted. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Okay, all those in favor of approving the agenda as posted, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Public participation. Is there anyone who wishes to address the board relative to any item at this time? We ask that a five minute time period per person be followed. So please come forward, state your name, address, and topic to be addressed. We ask that you have a seat here, and I don't see anyone coming forward. So then we will move on to recognition and thank you. Um, Dr. Carlson, the first recognition is for Roger King, the Herb Cole Educational Foundation Fellow. Uh, come on up here, Mr. Um, it really is a privilege to introduce Roger King and share with you that uh, Mr. King has been named a 2015 Herb Cole Educational Foundation Fellow. The, uh, the, uh, I'm going to just share a couple things that comes from the press release from the foundation. Uh, Mr. King is one of 101 teachers across the state being recognized. The fellowship recipients are chosen for their superior ability to inspire a love of learning in their students their ability to motivate others, and their leadership and service within and outside the classroom. Recipients are selected by a statewide committee composed of civic leaders and representatives of education-related associations and the program's co-sponsors, which include the Wisconsin Newspaper Association Foundation, the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction, the Wisconsin Council of Religious and Independent Schools, and regional cooperative educational service agencies. And so part of this, um, not only the foundation was established um, in 1990 by Senator Cole, and it awards $3,000 to each scholar and fellow, and $3,000 to each fellow's school. And that has recently been a change uh, for this year. And so the, to date, the foundation has awarded a total of about $9 million Wisconsin educators, students, and schools. So it's a real privilege to be standing next to this gentleman right here. We're so proud of him and what he's done for literally thousands of students in our school district. So this is so well deserved, and congratulations, Roger. Job well done. So proud of you. Half of the on behalf of the uh, school district, I certainly thank you for, um, you know, I, my, you, you look at education and you kind of look at a fit and something that really um, makes you feel like going to work every day. I think all of us see that, we know that, that's part of who we are, it's in our DNA and so on, and you refine that. And in education, I've been in here long, I'm starting my 31st year, and um, you start to kind of look and say, there's a lot of people that move from point A to point B in a lot of different <laughs> situations. So it, it is a tribute, I think, to the school district of Holman 
especially the fact that um, we, we have an opportunity to, to take a program that probably is more non-traditional in our district in today's day and age than it was 74 years ago or 78 years ago when it started. And so um, I look at it from the standpoint of an agribusiness program, an agri-science program. It's just an awesome opportunity and to touch the students and uh, see the change in curriculum over the years has just been uh, phenomenal. And the contacts both from the elementary to the uh, uh, high school and obviously the surrounding communities. So I, um, I thank the district on behalf of the Herb Cole Foundation to allow me to also have that opportunity. So thank you. Mr. King is going to stay up here and help me out with the next recognition, and it's a grant that one of our students spearheaded. And so I'm going to let Roger just talk a little bit about um, the grant and really what led up to it and the work of our student. The student that is Laura Munger is a student that um, is in our uh, agri-science program, and um, we had the opportunity in late October uh, when we went to our national FFA conference and they talk a little a lot about uh, partners throughout our country that try to take and continually look at how we can help to it's called a food for all grant and what can we do to produce food what can we do to make food sustainable in everyone's community and so the national FFA through foundation sponsors with the FFA um, offered the opportunity to local FFA chapters to write a $2,500 grant for anything that we could see that might be helpful in producing food and sustaining that in our community. So the gist of the grant is, is we are looking at, if you're unfamiliar with what we're doing in the school district right now, we do on a daily basis prov provide um, lettuce to the uh, school lunch program. And so we'd like to take and bring that to every level of the building, not just the high school. And so we've wrote a grant to put in uh, systems to allow um, other schools in our district to um, have their own growing system. Um, we're targeting the, um, the Sand Lake and the middle school. And then I'm taking one system with me to a state conference in summer, and I'm going to show any other schools in Wisconsin that have representatives there on how to build the system. So we're taking the rough parts and putting them together and uh, trying to give them an idea because a lot of us don't approach and do things because I don't know how. So we're trying to get that I don't know how out of the door and work from there. So that's the gist of the Food for All grant and hopefully we'll have more opportunity for our district and our students to uh, grow their own food. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Roger. Our next recognition this evening is for our student on Board of Education. So Alex Ackery, if you'd like to join me up here too. And Mrs. Hancock, if you'd be kindly to come around too and bring a certificate. And um, it's really been a pleasure. I've known Alex prior to this year, but it's been a pleasure to get to know him even more so. And we've um, done a lot of work meeting on a regular basis. And I just have really appreciated his really his passion and his interest. And um, I also know that I may be seeing him around even after this year, maybe down on the Luther campus in Decorah. And uh, so I wish him all the best too. But Alex, truly thank you for everything you've done for um, helping and really being a voice with the Board of Education and all your time and commitment and your passion for really the students in the school district. And so I didn't prepare you for this, but if you'd like to make a few comments. Oh. Okay. You have seven. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is unusual, Mr. Hancock. <laughs> well, we have something, uh, Mrs. Hancock, if you'd want to present. Um, token of our appreciation, Alex, it's been such a pleasure working with you and getting to know you. Best wishes to you in the future, and as I said, just a small token of our appreciation. Good luck to you, Joe. Oh. Let's, let's take a photo.
And one more recognition I just want to announce that coming up here, um, we have a couple special weeks. This week is volunteer week, and we, we have so much to be thankful as a school district for the number of volunteers. And so we celebrate our volunteers this week. The following week, we look forward to, on an annual basis, celebrating our administrative assistants, our secretaries, clerical, and our support staff throughout the school district. And so that will be coming up the following week. And so two very important rec recognitions and, and celebrations to be aware of as we approach this week and next week. Thank you. Thank you. And then moving on to reports and discussion, health insurance options, Mr. Clark. Recently, um, we offered staff meetings to inform the staff of the health insurance plan design changes we were considering for the upcoming uh, July 1st renewal. And what I'd like to do tonight is I'm not going to cover the content in detail, but what I would like to do is go through the presentation we made there. Um, this, by the way, is available on our website. If you go to the school district website, go under the business office department, then find the benefits drop down you'll see recent updates the 1516 health insurance presentation and that's what I uh, was in the board packets and what I'll go through with you uh, quickly tonight I would say that if there are any staff members who are still seeking information on this I'd be glad to meet with them on an individual basis I know not everyone was able to attend the two sessions that we did offer through the district I would say too that um, each year when we do this presentation, we offer the opportunity for those in attendance at the meeting to give us a letter grade, traditional A, B, C, D, or F, on the presentation. In fact, we break down each of the six to seven items that are presented. This year we got an A minus uh, from the group uh, that rated us, the, the people in attendance. So um, we'd like to get an A, but uh, we're feeling pretty good about A minus, particularly when the topic is health insurance. So to you imagine keeping people's attention and getting an A minus over an hour long presentation. So this is that presentation. Um, just try to. And we shared with them the timeline for decision making and you've seen this before. And again, I'm not gonna go through these things in detail. So I'm trying to give you a flavor for what we covered and for those staff not in attendance and for our community to know uh, what is happening at this time of year. Um, we talked about what employees and employers have told us in, in the past, the school district here, our employees, and we as an employer, what we look for in health insurance in terms of quality and cost factors. Those in green are those areas where we feel like we're performing pretty well, and those in red areas where maybe we should seek some improvement. Uh, we reviewed the health insurance plan history what happened in 2012-13, 13-14, and how we entered a two-plan configuration in 14-15. We talked about factors that drive health insurance premium increases and recognized while there are federal, state, uh, Medicaid, uh, demographic factors, the single factor that we can control is our loss ratio. And that took us to these set of slides, which talked about um, uh, unfavorable loss ratio, 104 five percent that is a dollar and five cents spent in insurance claims for every dollar that went into the plan uh, that traditionally drives your insurance premiums up rather quickly september 1st is highlighted here because we made a plan design change at that point which changed our loss ratio from 123 percent to 70 percent that's a positive very positive change. In 2014, again, we made a plan design change. This one occurring in July. And that change took us from 96% loss ratio to a 77%. So what this is illustrating is that the changes we've had have really helped to control premium cost increases. Um, we then looked at uh, what's happened since last July 1st and showed that for plan one design, we had 129% loss ratio, and the, for the plan two design offered by the district, a 63% loss ratio. Some had suggested that maybe the lower loss ratio was because employees were just being asked to shoulder a larger portion of the health care cost. 
This chart illustrates what's happened in 2014 to the cost of health care to our plan. And what we've done through the plan design changes is actually reduced the cost of medical care, not the cost paid by the employee or the cost paid by the employer, but through some choices that people are making, such as going to the neighborhood family clinic, which has much lower cost of service um, fees, uh, we've actually reduced the cost of the health care we're accessing. We shared with our employees what the health insurance plan of neighboring school districts looked like so that we could understand how we fare compared to uh, others in the area. We looked at private sector employers and what their plans look like and how much of the premium the employer is paying versus the employee in those uh, situations. And then we looked at what the two-year direction uh, is for the district, current year, uh, continuing for next year, at least two plan designs and potentially a third plan design for next year. And then looking out to another year from now in 2016-17 and what the plan design might look like at that point in time. And then showing item by item what the changes might be to the plan to design that the district has. We talked to them about the spousal subsidy provision and why we were looking at this based upon claims information. And then finally, this chart illustrates uh, some historical information on health insurance cost and what the impact of that is on people's take-home wages. And what we showed the, uh, in this example was uh, a teacher example and showed what would have happened to net wages if health insurance premiums had just continued to increase at the rate they would have. What would have happened was the employee's share of health insurance premiums would have almost fully eroded any wage increase that they received because their premium contributions would have been more. And this shows how in this case it was thousands of dollars additional in your pocket money the employees have as a result of the changes made to the plan. And that was it. It took nearly an hour and there were questions intermixed with that but again to give the board a flavor for what we're sharing with employees as we um, look now to get um, the quotes from the insurance company and come hopefully uh, two weeks ahead of schedule to the next meeting um, with a recommendation. That was not supposed to happen until two meetings, board meetings from now, but we're optimistic at this point in time we'll have something to share with the board at the next meeting. Oh, are there any questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you, Mr. Clark. We will move on to preliminary budget update. Dr. Carlson. Well, good evening. Tonight, I'm just going to give you, uh, as I said at the last meeting, try to give you a little bit of an uh, update on where we're at with the budget. As the board knows, we have not approved a preliminary budget as we typically would have by this time. The uh, discussion about the state budget uh, entered in, and we are uh, continuing to monitor and look at that. But tonight, uh, part of this, what I would like to try to cover would be Reviewing again the potential impact on our school district by the state budget. The February 9th draft preliminary budget summary. So going back to February 9th, what did we cover there and give you an idea, especially when it comes to staffing. And then the staffing plan summary, even though that has yet to come tonight on the board agenda, I'm gonna give just a little bit of an idea what you'd be looking at there. And then finally, some possible strategies, ideas to look at potentially trying to address this gap um, caused by what we know today anyway, the uh, governor's budget proposal. <clears throat> so Governor Walker's proposed 2015-17 state budget allows no increase in revenue limits in either of the next two years in the biennial budget. 
and that's a potential three hundred thousand uh, dollar revenue shortfall for us our school district for next year compared to the seventy five dollar per pupil increase allowed for this year the budget proposal eliminates one hundred and fifty dollar per pupil in per pupil aid in 2015-16 that would be the first year of the biennial budget an immediate and actual cut of about 125 27 million dollars um, uh, statewide uh, throughout the state on public education funding for us that would equal to about a six hundred thousand dollar adjustment base cut for our district that we would need to uh, figure in in our planning for next year um, and again uh, because this aid has been provided outside the revenue limit uh, districts have no authority to levy property taxes in order to help recapture the lost aid now in the past week there are some hopeful signs that perhaps some of us have seen um, as part of the uh, even the Republican side of the legislature that would show some promise in um, either part or all of the hundred and twenty seven million dollars being put back in but ultimately that's going to depend on really how the state is doing on its revenue and so we're still waiting so I think it's it's really um, responsible for us to really start looking and having that discussion here in the event that um, things don't go through as we hope they do <clears throat> So just stepping back a moment to February 9th, the draft preliminary budget that was presented included new expenditures of about $1.6 million. Uh, new costs included salary and benefit increases reflecting such things as um, the initial budget input variable that the board had established of 2% uh, increase in base wages for this coming school year. Now, since then, we, we do know that the consumer price index has come back at 1.62%. The initial budget input variable of 5% for health insurance increase in costs. And um, initial budget input variable of about 1.19%, 1.2% in a projected student enrollment growth. So there was a budget input variable then aligned with that on increasing staff. And about a 1.2% increase equates about a 4.0 full-time employment or FTE position when you're looking at classroom positions that are driven by student enrollment. So those were some of the things, those initial input variables that went into that uh, preliminary budget. Again, the 2% for base wages, the 5% for health insurance costs, which hopefully maybe even as short as two weeks, we will have more uh, direction on that. And then about a 1.2% increase on student enrollment aligned with an increase in staffing. Additional staffing positions beyond those four positions, enrollment-driven positions, including included early childhood, and two positions related to data and assessment. Um, and then also open enrollment tuition increases. We also had on there work, some increase in workers' compensation and general insurance increases. One-time allocations to instructional services, information and technology, buildings and grounds, and technology was, uh, and transportation was also included on that preliminary budget. So that, all of that made up about that $1.6 million increase. About, 510,000, so a little more than $500,000 of that um, really went to new staffing positions. So I'm just going to focus a little bit on the staffing, which I will talk more in detail. That's the next item on our agenda tonight. But just a little bit of a preview to that as it ties into our budget planning. So uh, I'm going to, I will provide an update on the staffing recommendations for this coming school year as referenced in the staffing plan that was included in your board packet uh, for tonight. The plan introduces at this time new staffing costs of about $300,000. So between $281,000 and $306,000. So about $300,000. This is a difference of about $200,000 when compared to that amount that I just shared with you 
as part of that preliminary report or budget back on February 9th. It will be my recommendation to the board to move forward with the staffing plan as presented to you this evening in a little bit. The staffing plan represents the board's longstanding commitment to maintaining class size um, at prescribed levels, providing needed services to students, and its core value of data-driven decision-making. The board will be asked to approve the staffing plan as presented at its next meeting on April 27th, or provide direction on any or all of the plan that needs to be revised or revisited or reprioritized due to the potential state budget impact as well. So if the recommendation is to approve the staffing plan as presented, what are possible strategies to address a potential $900,000 gap? At this time, I would offer strategies totaling close to $500,000. So tonight, you're not going to get a full $900,000 plan, but uh, at least upwards to about $500,000 as a starting point. My first recommendation would be we delay the one-time program allocations to instruction, information and technology, buildings, buildings and grounds, and transportation. And on that preliminary report back in February, that was a total of about $350,000. I would then also say that we would, should consider um, adjusting the base wage increase budget input variable uh, but ultimately that decision would want to be uh, processed through the negotiations process that the board has yet to work on as well. So that amount would be to be determined. Adjusting the health insurance budget input variable, as I mentioned tonight, it'd be five, it was 5% set at. And again, we remain optimistic that on its own, that rates will be favorable and may allow an adjustment to be made without significant changes. And again, we would hopefully within the next two weeks learn more about that, but that would be a potential. And then with the staffing plan, what's presented to you to make adjustments as presented. And again, <clears throat> you'll see when I get into more detail, there is about, at this point, even approving that staffing plan, there would be about a $200,000 adjustment already made. Um, between what's proposed is about $300,000, and from that initial preliminary budget in February, it was a little over $500,000. I need it. Could you, could you go back to number one? That, what are the one-time allocations sure. again? Sure, sure. Um, and I'm not sure. I bet I don't have that a visual, but they would be instruction, information and technology, so technology, buildings and grounds, and transportation. And what are the amounts? I believe, um, I believe it's 50,000 in instruction. Um, I'm, I, I believe so. Information and technology, I believe was 100. Buildings and grounds, 100. And transportation, 100,000. I don't have that in front of me of what was presented, but I believe that that would be accurate. Okay. So that gives us a starting point. That's what I wanted to do at least to present to you. I, again, what I, I like to be optimistic at the state level that there will be some positive adjustments um, from the state level as far as the biennial budget that we'll be, able to, we'll be able to come back to this and adjust. But I believe that this puts us in a, a, a place where, um, especially with the first item on delaying the one time, um, and I think it would be have a minimal impact, still an impact, but it would be, we try to distance um, as much as we can from the classroom right from the start. And so these would be some of those areas that I would suggest we, we look at first as far as moving forward. So I know not a lot of detail, um, especially before we go through the staffing plan, but questions at this point? I'm assuming you would have consulted with the department.
heads on those one-time allocations what well, type of response or what was the kind yeah. of the general thought well, process sure from those folks well mr. manager quite honestly I have not spent a lot of time this was a even going back to the process the unmet and underfunded need process where we look at prioritizing so I went back and spent time looking at that and how did we arrive at at the first place of putting those one-time allocations on that preliminary budget so as we've done in the last couple of years we've gone the route of those one-time allocations a little bit because of the uncertainty with the budget planning and so in fairness to some of those key people we have not had a lot of discussion at this point on the impact on those one-time allocations at, at this point and but we will um, but uh, again this when we developed came through our budget development process and we looked at those unmet needs that's what led kind of at the end after we looked at prioritized everything else ended up making those one-time allocation decisions so um, but I want to again be very um, straightforward in fairness to those department heads again we have not had real specific discussions on what that impact might be and so those dollars are not dollars out of their regular budget those are dollars that are in addition to their regular budget but based on the needs that were submitted right. many of those I think all four of those key areas at least the past two years they have had one-time allocations given to them on top of their budget in a couple of those areas we've over the last two or three years years we've also increased their ongoing allocation too but we've always maintained because of that uncertainty some degree of one-time allocations and we've had that in place this year as well so so are these figures their entire one-time allocation correct portion. okay correct yes other questions and again this is in response to the current budget state budget as we know it correct okay. okay so we haven't really talked about at what point will the board be comfortable in moving forward with that preliminary um, you know approval of a budget and we will need to visit more about that and talk more about that well I suspect some of the these things like the insurance will you know work its way out on its own instead of waiting till September or you know those kind of numbers should be coming as mr. Right. Clark said in the next few weeks and so right. those things will just naturally happen other things may it's probably good that people are aware of what potentially could happen though I think right okay then moving on to staffing report so I'm, we're going to make a transition. I'm going to have two others join me here. okay we're going to share with you um, changes in the staffing plan that's proposed for next year compared to this year the board will be asked to approve the changes at the April 27th board meeting I will review a few highlights as outlined in your staffing memo that hopefully you you have received and reviewed in your board packet So part of what I'll talk about more specifically, I'll go through each one of these, but you can kind of see a summary. This, this targets really the changes 
that you would that really directly tie into the instruction into our classrooms. So teaching positions is what that slide tries to summarize. And so as you can see, really the changes that are occurring are more at the high school level and pupil services district-wide, which really that I'll talk more specifically, but even within pupil services, why it's on this slide is it has to do directly with the classroom and specifically early childhood as well as in our ESL and TAG areas. Our four-year-old kindergarten, at this time, we are not anticipating a change, but as I reported out last time, especially with our four-year-olds, it's a, it's a tough one to project. To give you a little bit of an idea, we do base it on uh, some on our trends of the past several years. So we track how we're, where were we at this, at this time last year and, and so on. And we also have some other uh, data that we look at to try to give our best guess of where we're headed. But at this time, we're going to plan on status quo, at least from a staffing perspective um, for our four-year-old kindergarten program. At the elementary level, K-5, we similar where uh, at this time enrollment projections would suggest no change in the number of elementary classroom sections, which we are at 79 for this school year. There is a slight increase since last time elementary principals have have spent more time looking at this along with others and at this point we're pretty comfortable um, based on what we know in although it's still early similar to 4k that's our kindergarten projection is still uh, a, tip, a difficult one to project very accurately at times and so and then also we we know in our school district um, even when you get into the summer months things can fluctuate as well and and also the way we with our neighborhood schools and we focus on each individual school each individual grade level and so it doesn't take much and the board certainly is aware of this to move to increase one section um, as we watch and we closely monitor how that fluctuates throughout the next weeks, months, even throughout the summer. <clears throat> At the middle school, we're not anticipating a change overall in our full-time employment at this time. I do make a note that um, we continue to look at, with our house concept at the middle school, um, really, when you start to approach that 300 threshold, it gets to be very challenging and um, Mr. Vogler could attest to that. And so we are keeping a close eye on that even in the coming years as our enrollment with our elementary, as we build up to the middle school. It's something that when you approach that 300 level, we have to be really thinking about the impact on that, that structure of how we do things with our houses and the en enrollment and the class size within those houses. So it's something we're keeping an eye on and monitoring and looking at developing how will we adjust when that occurs. At the high school level, this is as every year, this always has the potential of a number of things going on. I did present a little bit on this at the last board meeting. We are projecting a total change of a little over one position increase in certified staff, the projected increase in student enrollment, and more courses being requested by students is occurring, has occurred through our subject selection process. And so staffing increases are based on student, again, driven requests in the areas, and you can see those, English language arts and science. And at the same time, based on student requests, we're looking at some reductions in areas such as Spanish, social studies, and French. We are, as I reported out last time, probably um, separate from the direct classroom instruction. Uh, one unique piece about this recommendation is an increase, a recommendation to increase our guidance area. And we are looking at a half-time increase in guidance but we also are working to combine that with a talented and gifted position which is a half-time position 
So Mr. Bear and his staff have been working on that concept, involving the key people in that discussion. And so we're, we're looking forward and quite honestly excited about that possibility. Uh, it's been about eight years since the last time we increased the guidance staffing at the high school. And currently we are at uh, close to about 400 students to one counselor. So that is higher when you, that's higher than most of our comparables when you look around. So it's, this is not something that's coming to this staffing plan just overnight. This has been looked at for multiple years. And um, again, we have a plan and an opportunity to not only increase and enhance that very important area, but to uh, combine it with our talented and gifted program. Uh, when I, anytime we talk about the word reductions, of course I'm, I'm asked then what does that mean, layoffs or reducing our force and in and, and our people right now, and none of this plan will drive any kind of, with our current people, any kind of, as you would call a layoff, or what we call a reduction in force. So there's no individuals are being impacted by any changes, whether it's Spanish, social studies, uh, French, and so on, or even in some of our other areas that I'll talk about, like within pupil services. <coughs> Wendy Savasky and Jan, we have been instrumental in developing the positions, uh, two, two positions, as much of the focus is on student learning as well as district information needs, especially focusing on our student information system. Along with assessment, we have recognized a specific gap in the area of school, of school and student information and data that we need to address. And I know this has been the, the talk about data and uh, has been with the board as well, um, even from our consultant. And so tonight I'm gonna ask Wendy and Jan talk a little bit about, specifically about these two positions. First, it's the 12-month information system specialist. It's an hourly position. And then Wendy will talk about the assessment and data coordinator position. And uh, along with this recommendation would be not to fill the vacant 10-month instructional services secretary position. This decision's been the result of examining Quite honestly, getting down to the greatest areas of need, these are all important um, within instructional services, but in order to advance these two positions, we feel at this time we would need to bring that uh, recommendation as part of this overall plan. There would be about a, a 95, a range of about a 95 to $120,000 impact. And again, this is part of that that $300,000 figure that I had presented earlier. So I'm gonna have, um, I think, Jan, are you starting? I think we have that going first. And I'm gonna have Jan talk about the specialist position, followed by Wendy. Okay, so the position that I'm going to talk about is a school information system specialist. And this position would provide support for our school information system that serves our staff, our students, our parents, uh, actually, there's about 10,000 stakeholders that are impacted by our school information system. All teaching staff, most educational assistants, support staff, secretaries, nurses, our food services, administrators, parents, and students. So, uh, just to give you an idea of the scope, depth, and breadth of the school information system, you can see that there are 21 essential um, modules within the system. It's very broad and very deep and has a lot of impact including state reporting. So data valid validity, data accuracy is extremely important for our school district. The next slide just gives you a little bit of an overview of what some of the key um, uh, requirements of the position would be full-time 40 hours per week hour, hourly we would call it um, the kinds of background that we're looking for would be an experienced IT um, related field or five years of experience working in a similar kind of data system a school information system 
we would like to see the person attain their certification as a campus administrator. These are specialized courses and um, outcomes that are commonly found with school information systems and Infinite Campus offers this kinds of a certifications and also the campus fundamentals. The position itself would report directly to um, the director of INT services. Why is the position needed? Well, data accuracy, documented da district procedures, dependable, accessible support, and guidance is really critical for our students, our staff, and our parents for whom this database provides such important data as transcripts and grading, portal services. Parents every day are logging into the portal. Students are logging into the portal, checking student grades, assignments, uh, other important pieces of um, data on their students, and state reporting. Um, is very important as well. Our special ed records are within the system, our IEPs. Um, recent survey, I, I did a recent survey of comparable districts. 10, um, Melissa was helpful in giving me some school districts that are uh, 10 that were a little bit bigger than us and 10 a little bit smaller. And out of that data, those reporting about uh, four fifths of them um, had noted that they have a full time student uh, school information system support. Uh, person um, so I think that that gives credence to the fact of the importance of a school information system uh, we need clear very clear processes and procedures this is a very major system which has a lot of impact documenting those um, procedures and processes is important uh, the functions within infinite campus change and grow and become more expansive we need to be able to help our end users use that well and efficiently um, and it's just important that our stakeholders are supported training and resources our secretaries who are working within the system they need training we recently had a change in the grading system and um, had a whole new end user environment and our teachers need to know how to make that migration over into that environment and use new features so those are just some of the reasons um, some of the job duties again I think I've referenced this already maintain document audit update there are literally thousands of decisions made relating to the information system every year and updates uh, we do have uh, 7,000 user accounts in the system we have 240 rights groups in the system so keeping that information updated accurate we have staff coming in and out that's all very important to make sure we audit it uh, sometimes you don't know what you don't know until you take a deep look at data and you see duplication and errors that could be entering into the system and that's a very important part of this job is data validity data accuracy so again, you can see on the screen um, a lot of these uh, I've already referenced. And end user account management, I can't even tell you how important. Every morning I am checking uh, for emails from parents seeking help. Our, food, uh, in, our um, food services folks came on board this year or last year with their uh, point of sale software. Parents are checking their portal accounts all the time. Students are checking their accounts to see how they're doing with their, their grading. Um, and um, this person would be responsible for troubleshooting issues within the school information system. So that gives you a pretty, pretty comprehensive view. I'll give it to Wendy. So the assessment and data coordinator, I know you all wondered really what that position was and the need for the position. So I hope tonight I can highlight the need for this position. So the little target is purposeful on here. I think there are some things that we're doing really well, but some that we're missing the target because we've outgrown our current system of collecting data. So currently, our assessment database, our teachers enter student assessments within the assessment database or reports from, from standardized tests are uploaded into the assessment database. It is a freestanding program, which means that it does not communicate 
for example, with the school information system. So we are very dependent on others letting us know when there are changes as far as when students enroll in the district, when they leave the district, if they are identified for having a disability free and reduced status because we are really looking to that minutia piece of data and looking closely. Um, we are also beside looking at our different subgroups, we're also starting to look at so that we can make data decisions, looking at the domains and clusters for our standards. We would love to get down to the standard level, but we just don't have the manpower or to do that at this time. Um, so one other piece of the assessment database, because there is a great deal of information within the database, um, it's quite slow. It's not unusual to click on the icon to get into the database and, and wait a minute or longer for the database to even populate. Another shortfall of the assessment database is it's only accessible within the district, not that we would like teachers to have to take data or things home to work in the evening. It's just sometimes convenient to do that type of work at home and different type of work at the school. Um, so then another piece then is the Excel spreadsheets. The assessment database holds all the data, but often or every time for our PDSAs, the data has to be printed and then I manually entered into different Excel spreadsheets so that the PDSA teams can use it. <coughs> Buildings and departments are also creating their own Excel spreadsheets. I know um, some folks in my department are working on Excel spreadsheets to get to the standard levels so that teachers can make decisions about student learning to say what's really working, what do they need more support on. Just to give you an example of how many pieces of data that would be currently with what's in the database, it's over 60,000 different pieces of data that is entered by teachers or uploaded. Um, so overall it's just not, like I mentioned, we've outgrown it. It's not very effective because of the amount of time the turnaround on the data is not very quick because everything has to be taken then from the assessment database and entered manually into a spreadsheet. It's not very efficient and because of the accuracy if, the if information is not given to us in our department, you know, the data is not correct. And in, in addition, the more times you handle the data, the more chances that there is going to be an error made and then decisions won't be made on correct data. So here is just a kind of a very brief, you know, requirement for this. It will be similar to the other coordinator positions within our district, which is a teacher contract. We would like a person with a Bachelor of Science degree in information management. A master's degree would be preferred, but also it would be very key for this person to work hand in hand with the position that, that Jan has mentioned because they will need to have a deep understanding of the school information systems in order to to create dashboards and for teachers to enter their data directly into the school information system instead of the database. We'd also like the person to be able to help with interpreting and analyzing the data. This person will also help me in facilitation of the assessments and dissemination of the data and help with our overall continuous improvement in our district and because a lot of that falls underneath my umbrella, the person would report to the Director of Instructional Services. So 
So I think I mentioned a few of these. Um, so to ensure data ac accuracy, and again, having the data handled the least amount of time so the teachers and the exports would be able to be made right within Infinite Campus. And within Infinite Campus, then there would be student dashboards, class dashboards, grade level dashboards, so that the information would be received in a timely manner. We have also contracted with Wise Dash Local, which is it communicates with Infinite Campus and it will put the data that's entered into Infinite Campus right into to graphs and tables so that educators may use that data too. Um, in addition, the WISE Dash Local will be able to create our own dashboards, so additional data as far as student behavior data, which we collect for PBIS or our response to intervention data, we will be able to collect that, which is new data that currently we're using different spreadsheets for. Um, another benefit to having this setup would be that educators would be able to access because they are entering it right within Infinite Campus. They would be able to access and enter student data when they're not within the district. This person then would also be able to offer training and resources for teachers, principals, and even buildings and departments when we think about our, our continuous improvement. So I think we're to questions. So, yeah, I would like to stop. Before we go on to pupil services, this might be a good place to stop and allow you to have some questions about these two positions. Um, specifically and because these two positions are somewhat unique compared to the rest of the staffing plan these are new positions there's other new positions part of the staffing plan but many of those as you already know are driven by our student enrollment and, and direct needs in the classroom so um, there's a lot of there's been a lot of work going into these two positions uh, um, a lot of adjustments over time. There's a lot of information presented to you, um, but I thank these two for the work they've done. The challenge of actually presenting it tonight in a very concise way as best as we can because it's so involved. And yet, um, so in fairness to you, we'll do our best. I'm gonna let these two try to respond as best as we can, and I will add as I can as well. So questions about these two positions and then we can, and then I would like to finish the PowerPoint about pupil services, bringing it all together, and then take more questions overall about that. But right now, these two positions. Questions on these? So, just the information specialist position would report to you, Jan, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, I don't. I guess I have questions. I'm just still listening, Wendy. It's hard, it's hard to follow and kind of comprehend all the, I don't know. I'm just taking notes and trying to make sense of it as I'm listening, so I'll just keep listening. Well, and I think what my confusion is on is we have infinite campus, but not all of our data is in there. We have another database. It sounds like that's school information systems that we're pulling assessment so right now, no student test data is kept within Infinite Campus because we don't have an easy way to get that data out and, or to be accessible. So we have the assessment database and the assess assessment database has been in place for a number of years in our district. So it's not because Infinite Campus can't take that data. We just don't have the personnel that can pull it out. So right. we just haven't put it in there. Correct. And this, the school information systems, you mentioned sure. that someplace, is that a, another database besides the assessment database? Can I answer that? Or? I think it was on yeah. your slide, Wendy. Yeah. And, and actually, they are separate. The assessment database is is an access database for those of you who are familiar with Microsoft. Mm -hmm. It's an access database where the school information system is our infinite campus. So it would be putting all the information instead of the separate standalone access database right into infinite campus. 
So eventually the idea is to have all of the information in Infinite Campus. Yes. And so, but there still would be a need for two positions then to pull that information out? Because assessments are changing, yes. And the data that buildings, departments are asking for, most definitely. And you talked about Y-Dash or something? Wise-Dash. Wise-Dash. So and they are doing what for us? So they will then, the, they will talk, the program will talk specifically to Infinite Campus and how right now I then, how I take everything out of Access Database and then re-enter it into Excel so that we have the charts. It will talk to it and it will create the charts so I won't be doing it manually anymore. And then it'll be more accurate. And is that, what is that, Wise Dash? So that's a service or is that a program? It is actually it's a it's both it's both a service and a program. Currently um, if you go on to the Department of Public Instruction the student data is within Wise Dash for the state assessments but Wise Dash local would let us do our own local assessments within there too. So I guess what I'm I can see where we would need to move from that access database into getting, you know, I always thought we had all the information in Infinite Campus that that's, you know, when we purchased that software, that was what we were moving toward. But, um, you know, with a lot of institutional research, I think, which is what I'm familiar with on the college level, that are, is people that are, you know, mostly in that IT area. So it is the assessment position is kind of a different one for me to be not in the technology, the IT area. I've always been, it's always kind of been separate, but um, I can see how the assessment would be so close to what you do. So maybe just for giggles, when we ask you for information or when information comes down from DPI on the WKCE tests or mm -hmm. whatever the assessment's going to be, Right now, you're doing all of that work mm -hmm. to get that and to gather that instead of... Um, right. Okay. And so in the new realm, we would be having an assessment manager helping you with that or doing that for you. Correct. With you. Yeah, I know we, we talk about being a data-driven um, school district. It's one of the first things we talk about, but we've not really adjusted for who's going to do that data and there's I want to add too. there's no question that the majority of the data that we focus on is having to do with student learning in the classroom Wendy also as you know the last couple of years as we have gone down really um, gone down the path of continuous improvement and as the boards work with your PDSA but that's better throughout our school district all of that in so many ways has been given to Wendy and her, her, her office to really help lead us and champion us through, through all that. And so you, you mentioned or Wendy mentioned there about continuous improvement. That's just a, a couple words, but quite honestly, there's a lot involved there that really has, in a positive way, done so many good things for our district, but we're not realizing we're not close to really realizing the overall capacity of what we could achieve through that. So, so this is also to enable, to assist Wendy and her department to really, um, really march forward with that, as well as then, quite honestly, allow Wendy to do so much more in that direct servicing to our staff and our principals at the building levels. So. Again, a lot involved here, but um, I just thought I would add that, throw that in. Tom, did you have a question? Yeah, I'm just curious, how many other school systems uh, across the state have these positions in their districts, do you know? A great number of them do. I know like La Crosse has a person in this position. I did not survey our folks, but if needed, I could. I know, Jan, you mentioned that you did a survey and you said like four out of five four-fifths of them all had or, the position. Yes, out of the ones that answered. Right. So, yeah. Had your, the position you had presented. Yes. Mm -hmm. They also have data and assessment people. Okay. 
most of them. I think you'll find a mixture. It's kind of how the, that school district is set up, whether you, one of you talked about um, IT versus assessment, I mean, versus instruction. Um, and not sure how many, but a school district may be set up differently where through kind of that operations department, um, even technology is housed. So it's hard to really describe what we need to do is what's going to work for us. And, and we do, and thanks to their work, we've looked at other districts, try to take the strengths, the positives, learn from maybe some ways that we could improve um, from them. But quite honestly, what, what will work and fit um, our needs and kind of our structure that we already have set up here. Any other questions, comments? So um, the, the tests that are going to be shifted onto Infinite Campus are, are what? Because students love an Infinite Campus. That's a great resource. I'm really glad we have it. But I'm just wondering, so what is going to be put on it if this becomes reality? <clears throat> the list is pretty long, Alex. <laughs> well, <clears throat> what are the highlights, like so, WKCE? So definitely WKCE, ACT Aspire, ACT, right now the Badger exam, PALS for our pre-K two that, it, you know, those are all the required state exams, but we also do have local assessments like Ames Web, MAP, um, our Fontes and Pinnell reading level, our writing assessments. We also have local math assessments. So there's quite a bit of assessment data that would be entered within there. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Then moving on to pupil services. Thank you. <clears throat> So in the area of pupil services, uh, we show that overall would be an increase of a 1.0 FTE special education teacher. This is that early childhood teacher that we've talked about. In fact, just recently the board had put in place for the rest of this year a limited term. And so we've realized the needs there for some time and that ties into those classroom instructional needs. Coupled with that, anytime we've really added that teacher in the special education area, especially at the 4K or EC 4K or, or um, elementary levels, that we look at support for that classroom through educational assistance. And so we have included seven hours at this point. Now, I would have to say visiting with, with uh, Ms. Krakow and so on, that there remains the possibility that we could fill this position through transfer. But I'm not, I, I, I'm more comfortable including it as part of the staffing plan at this point um, as an increase and not a, not a transfer. Moving on, you see a reduction of 0.5 FTE, um, English as a Second Language, ESL, um, and, and coupled with that, an increase in TAG. Um, with the ESL, we would be looking at right now, this year we had a limited term ESL classroom teacher at the 4K level. That was limited term. We knew going into this year, um, pretty confident it would just be for this year at the 4K level based on some unique needs. Uh, we feel that we could capture some of that. Uh, we need to look at, we have a growing need at our middle school and so the plan would be to capture a half of that position, half of that reduction, and increase our ESL at the middle school by 0.5 right now. Currently, our middle school has a full-time position that that individual shares responsibilities in ESL and TAG. So the plan would be, and this moves into that next position on TAG, the plan would be at the middle school level to split that into two full-time positions. So you would have a full-time ESL position, and we would also increase the talented and gifted position at the middle school. So in the end, it offsets one another, 
um, between the ESL changes and the tag increase. So if you couple the, the reduction of the one position at the 4K level in ESL, you increase ESL at the middle school by half, and you increase TAG at the middle school by half, it really offsets one another. And we, uh, again, we preliminarily have taught. Mr. Vogler has done some exploring with our current staff um, in that area, and we feel we, what the end result would be, I believe, uh, this would result in a opening in the ESL area. And um, our current person would move into the full-time TAG. So, and then, um, so the net increase in the area of pupil services that you see here would be a staff cost of approximately $105,000. Now that again is built in already to that range of 281 to 306 that I had presented earlier. And I add a note there, we continue to monitor those three-year-olds for that early childhood program. So to summarize, what you have seen tonight in the plan, I have summarized it a little different, give you a little different look. For direct classroom instruction so in the classroom, we have a little over two positions. Those high school changes that were about 1.08, and then the 1.0 in as far as early childhood that I just presented. So you have a little over two positions that really focus in specifically on the classroom. You have that educational assistant position. The two district level data assessment positions that were presented to you. Now, I show you the range of those two positions, and then I put the proposed elimination of the secretary position. You combine those together, and that's where you get that earlier range that I provided you. So overall, there's a net cost increase again, around $300,000 in this staffing plan. That compares, as I mentioned, that compares, if you go back to that preliminary budget from February 9th, there was close to $300,000 for enrollment-driven positions in the four FTEs. And there were the early childhood and the two data positions that were a little over $200,000. So that's why, that's where we ended up with that $510,000 figure. So as I, early, as I reported earlier, the combined total of more than $500,000, um, there is a difference right now of about $200,000 that's presented to you in the current staffing plan. But we have, again, we have a long time to go in monitoring student enrollment projections, especially at the elementary level. So final thoughts, um, how do we balance the need for the increased staffing? Even with the potential budget challenges we are facing, um, as we talked earlier about the governor's budget proposal, um, our ongoing commitment to class size, um, the area of student services, I mentioned the guidance at the high school, for example, and then our data-driven decisions, which Jan and Wendy has helped uh, identify those positions. So for us, next steps would be for the board's consideration at the April 27th board meeting of seeking approval on the staffing plan as presented. So that's uh, now any overall or final questions. I know we've taken quite a bit of time here, but. Questions. So just to clarify, without, the, without any change um, in Madison with the budget, we would need to address about $900,000. But if, if the budget would change, as it's been indicated that some of the cuts would be, um, I don't know, they've said they, it, they would try to, right, if they find more revenue, they would right. try to. Um, we would be okay with the staffing plan if the cuts don't happen. But if the cuts happen is when we would need to address that staffing plan. We certainly would be in better shape. I would, I would just say that right now in what I've seen, um, the updates in the last couple of days, it would be first targeting that per pupil age, so that $127 million. We had already put in 
a planned increase of $75 for the revenue limit. I'm still not seeing any evidence that that's going to happen. So I still think we would need to be prepared at least that $300,000 amount. And which again, that's why I went to work at least on starting some possible strategies to address at least a portion of the 900, at least 300 to $500,000. And that would, that would still though enable the board to move forward with the staffing plan as presented. Okay, that's what I was. Okay, okay any other? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Then we will move on to um, CESA 4 contracted services. Well, I don't have it in front of me, but just for my desk here, you have in your board packet the, the uh, recommendation for our services. We'll come back on April 27th to ask for approval. Very similar as you go down the list to this current year, you'll see probably some of the noted changes would be in the itinerant um, on service levels. And uh, those, though, are areas that can change depending on even one child, whether it's in vision or a deaf and hard of hearing. And so, but right now, as of today, that's what we're projecting. And so I believe we had this year's total budget-wise. Oh, do I have it in front of me? Oh. Thank you. So you can see that. Um, we listed what we are proposing and what we have tentatively submitted to CESA um, on the right side, and then the current year is the strikeouts. So there is some reductions of what we're projecting under the special education service area especially, and um, again, mainly in those itinerant areas that could change. So uh, unless you have questions, this is what we would be coming back in the next two weeks. And there may be a possibility even in the next two weeks that we have adjustments to this if we have good reason to believe some uh, increases in student needs. Questions Any questions on this? And I have some people that can help me out on specifics if needed. Okay, no questions. Okay. Thank you. Okay, then we have four items under consent agenda. I would, um, unless anyone would like to have any items separated, uh, I would entertain Mrs. a motion. Mrs. Hancock, I'm oh, sorry I'm to sorry. Inter yes, interrupt. Yes, that's right. Can I? Before we do consent, you wanted to make a comment. I'm sorry. Yes, to on your consent agenda, you have part of the personnel report. Uh, Mr. Jim Smith at the high school, uh, 19 years, I believe, of service in the school district, and he's made that difficult decision to make this his last year and uh, go into retirement and but I know he has another uh, career that he's uh, looking forward to as well so we thank Mr. Smith for all the the work and all his service the years of service and the again so many lives have been changed in a positive way because of him so that's on your personnel report tonight thank you so it is included in our consent agenda are there any items you'd like to have considered separately Seeing none, then I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda items as presented. Motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay, motion has been made and seconded to approve the consent agenda items as presented. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Then board member reports and discussion. I'll call on board members in the order of the roll call for you to present any committee um, or comments, committee reports or comments. Tim Menninger. Um, I have two things this evening, and uh, one is uh, somewhat negative, one is positive, so I'll end with the positive one. Uh, both of these are, are, I think, newses that affect the uh, school district of Holman here. But I think we might have seen that the uh, um, Badger, uh, excuse me, Badger Cooley line uh, was approved by the PSC and uh, that is obviously a, a, a large negative and as someone who has attended a lot of the PSC meetings it, it still is puzzling as to the lines coming into the substation at Briggs Road to have to go right back out on separate lines and I have not seen the final map but looks like it probably will be going over the elementary school um, there's an added cost to all of the ratepayers. It's, uh, I think, 14 extra miles at roughly a million dollars a mile that they're paying uh, to bring it in to go back out. And I've continued to ask that question, why it comes in to go back out. 
Um, I, I certainly can't figure it out, um, but I do know that there is a local uh, power company that was a partner in the original plan uh, that had power lines in the current location of that substation, and uh, that is also somewhat puzzling, that entire, entire project. So um, not so good news. Uh, some good news, and I'm sure others will mention this, so it's good that I'm up front tonight, but very exciting news on the referendum a couple of weeks ago. I think that is great news for the school district of home, and I certainly want to thank um, all those individuals who took the time to vote in, in support of that. Uh, that is great news for the school district, and thank you. Um, I also want to certainly recognize those people who voted against it, and I think that's great, the participation, and uh, certainly as a board, I think uh, my hope is that we'll work very hard to earn your support as we go forward and um, use those dollars wisely. So thanks to everyone for, for their support here um, at the recent uh, referendum. Okay, thank you, Mr. Manninger. Uh, Mr. Dunlap. I would just like to echo the, echo the same thing, and that's thank the community for passing the referendums. I think it was, it was needed, and uh, I think we can uh, move a lot of pressing questions forward with it, with the extra money, and that's all I have to say. Okay, uh, Mr. Cruz? Um, I mimic everything these two gentlemen said. i 100% happy with the referendum. I wanted to compliment Alex. I've enjoyed working with him a lot. He's an impressive young man. He's going to do great things. So, so he didn't pay me to say that either. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, Mr. Ockrey. Well, um, this is my last meeting. It's been an interesting year. I'd like to thank you all for giving me that opportunity. Yeah, I look forward to the future. Um, now, as a student looking at the, um, the proposed positions for the, um, the data person adding things to Infinite Campus, um, I love Infinite Campus. I think it's an invaluable resource. You know, yeah, your grades are ready to use your, you know, you can see your grades, you can see your schedule, things like that. But um, for like test scores from WKC or things like that, those are great. But, you know, if it's going to cost the school money and we're going to have to, you know, take money away from other things or that money could go to other things to help the student body, then as a student, I would fail to see the point to that position. Um, just a personal point of view. Um, but that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. And Mrs. Jagosinski. Um, I wanted to say congratulations to Roger King on his um, Herb Cole Educational Foundation Fellow uh, Award. Um, he's always, it seems like every, every meeting he's getting another award or every time we go to a school board convention, they have like a Roger King bronze statue or something. <laughs> it's just really neat. He really deserves it. He's, what a guy. And we're really lucky to have him here. And then to see um, Laura Munger. I work in West Salem and she's a student from West Salem who came here. So reading the board packet over the weekend, I saw her name and she's a great kid. And to see that she got that, um, got that uh, grant for our district is just really cool. She's a wonderful girl and what a neat thing for her to do for our district. So I was really proud of her. Um, anyhow, I would also like to say thank you to everybody who voted for the referendum. Um, and working in West Salem, again, I was asked over and over right after the, um, <coughs> right after last Tuesday, how do you guys do it in, in Holman? Because in West Salem, having their referendum fail twice and it's kind of bittersweet because working in the middle school there and having their referendum fail twice and having ours pass almost every time we ask, I don't know how we do it other than we really have a, such a supportive community that really cares about kids and doing what's best for the kids in our schools. And that's really the bottom line. I like to think we're a little more progressive than West Salem. <laughs> and, and I mean that in a good way. I don't mean it as a slam. I'm really, really proud of our community. We really do support our schools and our education. And that's how I feel. And I love working in West Salem too, but they need to get with the program a little bit. <laughs> um, and the other thing is um, it's sports season, Tim, and there's a track meet tomorrow because last <laughs> Tuesday's was canceled. And I did bake brownies and they went to the, I believe to John Daly's maintenance guys. They oh. picked them up and ate them. So um, anyhow, we are, we have the concession booth open tomorrow. I'll be helping out and we need help. So if anybody wants to work concessions at the track concession booth tomorrow, 
feel free to just stop in. You can work anytime between 3.30 and, you know, pitch dark when the track meets usually end. <laughs> stop in and it'll be a lot of fun. Um, and Darty will be there. It'll be like Darty Berg reunion night. She's helping out too. So it'll be a good time. So stop in and cheer on the um, Holman Vikings track meet. And we also need a lot of help for the May 29th sectionals is here this oh. year, which will be a really big meet. And It'll be a lot of fun, so feel free to stop in and sign up to help on May 29th, too. And that's all I have. Did I hear the weather forecast is 70s and sunny? It's 71 tomorrow. tomorrow and sunny that's and not a drop of rain. And I am grilling the hot dogs because my husband <laughs> is going to the Milwaukee area tomorrow. Yeah. It's not track meet weather, is it? <laughs> yeah, it's perfect. It is. Be beautiful. So, great. Right. Well, yeah. thank you. Yeah. And congratulations to you um, and Kate for your reelection. No, the election was, we had the referendum, which we're very um, pleased with that, but also um, you and Kate being reelected. Um, Alex, I would note thank you for your year of service and congratulations. Now, do we have a new student on board? Has that been um, confirmed or? Mm, they're, they had a primary. The final election will be on the 14th, okay. I believe. So tomorrow. Yeah, I guess. Okay. Well, wonderful. We'll we look forward to that as well. And hopefully we'll be watching you and as you progress through things and come back and enjoy a board meeting or two oh, yeah. if you're on spring that's break next year. I'm sure that's what you really want to do. <laughs> um, I would note that compensation um, model meeting and the personnel governance meetings are both um, scheduled later this month because we have a couple of um, evening events coming up to Wednesday and Thursday. We have um, candidates coming in for our district administrator position and we would really like to have a good turnout from the community um, from our staff and um, all the stakeholders and students. We would encourage everyone to come. There will be a brief presentation by the candidates and then an opportunity for questions and answers um, from those participating. Very much like the League of Women Voters, you'll submit a question and it will be asked by a moderator so that we can combine um, similar questions and not be redundant. But we would really like to encourage people in the community to come out and participate in that. Um, and then finally, I just would like to thank Dr. Carlson for the work that you did and congratulations on that referendum passage. I was surprised. I thought that the first question would pass by more than the second question just because of issues like Mr. Brown brought up some issues, some concerns about that second question. And I thought maybe that um, would be one that people wouldn't support as much and it was the opposite way. And so that was kind of intriguing that night when those results came in to try to figure out why it was a little skewed that way. Usually a top, when we had four questions years ago, the first question got the most votes, the second had enough votes but a few less than the first, the third had fewer, and the fourth one was the um, Empire Stadium that passed by, what, 72 votes or something like that years ago. So, um, so yeah, it, it just was kind of surprising. But a job well done um, in getting out and getting to the community and making sure people who wanted to be informed had an opportunity to be informed. So Truly a team effort on this one. And Your leadership team, I know, there, were out there, so. too, talking to folks. And, and thank you so very much for all the work that you did as well. Um, so that's all I have under my comments. Um, let's see, you, uh, school board election results. <coughs> We've mentioned them. I did meet with the other members of the certification um, canvassing team this morning. We met and we did um, certify the votes. It was 52.25% for referendum question number one and 60.31% for referendum question um, number two, and then Anita and Kate's um, totals were accurate as they were reported in the, the news and on the county website. So we did have that happen. Um, board meeting schedule, April 27th, we have a school board meeting. I know we're trying to possibly schedule a meeting on the 20th, and Tim and Gary, I don't know if you were able to connect with Christina um, about that. Um, also May 11th, we have a school board meeting. The senior banquet, we're talking about senior banquet, um, is May 20th. May 23rd is graduation. I was thinking it was a week later, so I'm really glad that was on here. So it's, you know, graduation is May 23rd um, at the Lacrosse Center. 
So, any reflections on the meeting this evening? If not, then I would ask um, our Vice President, Mrs. Jagosinski, would you read the motion for the closed session, please? Um, I would make a motion to go into executive session. Uh, be it resolved that the Board of Education moves to executive session as per Wisconsin Statute 19.851C for the purpose of considering employment, promotion, compensation, or performance evaluation data of any public employee over which a governmental body has jurisdiction or exercises responsibility, in this case, deliberating upcoming collective bargaining over total base wages for affected professional and non-professional staff members. Is there a second? Is there a second? Second. And then roll call, Christina. Kate Mayer. Pass. Yep. Yes. Lisa Collins excuse. Gary Dunlap. Yes. Tom Cruz. Yes. Cheryl Hancock. Yes. And Anita Jagazin. Yes. So we will come back into closed session at 8.35. Give us a couple minutes here. Minutes. Before Go. you leave, could I down 